we are good. All right. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Ann Lewis. I am currently the um, Grants Program Director at the South Dakota Discovery Center in Pierre. And maybe you've already done this, but uh, have you seen where folks are from? I understand this is sort of a national or a wider reach audience. Um, it looks to me like uh, anybody who's not from South Dakota, can you um, put up a hand or say something in the chat? <laughs> Well, that was just curious. I just wanted to yeah. make sure that um, I think we've got all South Dakotans right now. Oh, sweet local local folks. So I'm here to talk oh, about oh, from Rhode one. Island. Oh, <laughs> hey, hi, hi, Rhode Island. Hi, Robin. Um, I'm originally from New York, uh, closer to closer to Rhode Island than it is South Dakota. But um, hi, thanks for joining us today. So uh, our topic today is a micro presentation on macro invertebrates and. Um, First of all, macroinvertebrates, not an everyday kind of word. And I'm specifically meaning aquatic macroinvertebrates. So if that's an unfamiliar word to you, that's OK. Uh, does anybody want to unmute and just since we're a small group and just kind of shop out uh, what they think or they know a macroinvertebrate is? Large spiny creatures. <clears throat> Large spiny creatures. <laughs> Large spiny creatures. Um, oh, yeah, you're on the right track. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you some macroinvertebrates. Um, let's see. Oops, I wrong think screen. Kathy Greedy said um, something without a backbone. Something without a backbone. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of different uh, concepts here. Um, and this, this site here uses fresh water. You'll hear me use the term aquatic. So let's start with macroinvertebrate though. So the first uh, breaking out is macro. And macro falls between micro and mega on the size scale. Um, it, it usually means large enough to see unaided with your eye. That's usually how it's defined. Um, I will say macro can benefit from magnification to take a look to see it um, yeah, more up close. And there's no, I've seen size definitions, um, but since all of us have varying vision, I wouldn't um, put too much emphasis on the size. If you can see something with your eye, but you feel like it would benefit from having some sort of magnification, to me, that's the version of macro because you need to get up close and it needs to fill whatever it is you're looking at. Some of you may have uh, phones with a macro mode. And if when you zoom in, you'll see a little flower appear on, on your phone somewhere. And that means it's, um, it's in macro mode because that whatever you're looking at is filling the viewfinder. So the next word is invertebrates and uh, without a background, that's absolutely right. Um, so anything that's large enough to need a magnifying glass to be seen, but you need a magnifying glass, not a microscope, but just some sort of aid that does not have a backbone qualifies as a macro invertebrate. This word up here, freshwater, like I said, I also will use the term aquatic, means that these little critters live some or all of their lives in lakes, streams, or ponds or rivers. Um, so they're aquatic to semi-aquatic. Uh, often you will see uh, uh, an organism, particularly an insect in the nymph or larval stage, aquatic, and then through the power and the uh, fantasticness of metamorphosis, it becomes an adult and it becomes a terrestrial organism. So there's like this really fascinating connection between water and land. So uh, everybody feeling good about the definition of aquatic macroinvertebrate right now? So, okay. It's a pretty, it's a, it's a sort of a $5 word for a 50 cent concept kind of. You know, uh, so what you're looking at here is a website, uh, macroinvertebrates.org. And um, this has the nine different 
insect orders that you that qualify as a freshwater macroinvertebrate. Now, insects or macroinvertebrates can be something other than insects. Knowing what you know about the definition, uh, just drop in the chat what you think a freshwater macroinvertebrate could be that may or may not be an insect. Just shoot me an example. Fish. Fish actually have a backbone. So they're vertebrate. Crawdad, yeah. They have anything with an exoskeleton. Octopus? Octopus. Um, yeah. You won't probably find those in uh, fresh waters, but they're a marine invertebrate, aquatic invertebrate. Absolutely. My expertise, because we're in South Dakota, is um, fresh waters, rivers, lakes, streams, and ponds. I, I think we are about as far as you can be from the ocean in any direction here in South Dakota. Mosquitoes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, mosquitoes in their in their little larval stage um, are very aquatic. So yeah, and those are an insect. Those are actually in the oh, what family? What order? In the Diptera, a mosquito is a kind of fly. So, so uh, let's just take a look at some of my favorite macro invertebrates. Um, and one of my favorites is in the Odonata order. And if you remember your uh, taxonomy way back from high school, we have, well, there's now a domain, <laughs> which is above kingdom. And those of us who learned to start at kingdom, uh, domain is, and that's to separate out things like, um, I don't know, like viruses and things like that. I'm not even sure. But now we start with kingdoms, plants and animals. And so these and these critters are in the animal kingdom. And then the next one is phylum. And I remember it as keep ponds clean or fish get sick. That's the taxonomic order of kingdom phylum class order genus species. So what these what we're looking at here are the orders of aquatic macroinvertebrates, specifically insects. Insect is a class. Uh, arthropod is the um, um, phylum. So we're looking at the phylum, arthropod, class, insect, and all of these are different orders. So let's take a look at the odonata. And these are sort of rock stars of of the uh, macroinvertebrate world. Um, probably because they're so familiar to us, we know what they look like on land. Um, but they have this like really fascinating beginning. So I actually am partial to damselflies. And damselflies um, you'll find in a lot of water bodies in South Dakota. Uh, dragonflies as well, but particularly damselflies, because they're suited, well suited to the kinds of freshwater bodies we have here. Um, they, freshwater here tends to be ponds, you know, or very slow, shallow, highly sedimented streams. We have a few major river systems, you know, the Big Sioux, of course, the Missouri, which has been so altered that um, Actually, when I go sweep the Missouri, I hardly ever find <laughs> macroinvertebrates. Um, but their their damselflies are super super common. There's a little pond in Pier that I go to frequently, and uh, I always can count on finding lots of lots of damselflies. And I'm gonna just enlarge one of these guys here. Okay, and this is what one looks like sort of up close and personal. Now, this part up here, um, can you see my cursor okay? Okay, this part you probably won't see if you were to ever scoop one out of a stream because this is its jaw, its labial, labial mask essentially. And unless it's, you know, for some reason you happen to scoop it out and it's sticking it out, um, you probably won't see it. So, but the rest of this looks pretty familiar. All insects, of course, have three parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So here we can see its head. And then the thorax, that's where in an adult insect, the wings are attached. 
And in all insects, the legs come out. So they're attached to the thorax as well. Um, and then in the abdomen, and I have this straight from the state entomologist uh, of South Dakota. This is where the squishy bits are. So um, there'll be a test later. Squishy bits will be on the test. Those sort of these high uh, scientific concepts. So here we see the head, the thorax, and the uh, abdomen. Uh, six legs, of course, because it's an insect. And you can, this is a really good picture. So you can see these tiny little claws at the end. I think they're adorable. Um, maybe some people don't but I think they do. I think they are. Damselflies usually have tails and it can be three tails or two tails often depending on um, the, the, the uh, species. And these tails are actually gills. This is how the damselflies breathe. And not all tails on all insects are gills, but on the damselflies they are. So I've just thrown a lot of questions at you about the damselfly. Um, anything you want to ask? Those two things on the tail, they look like eyeballs. What are those? Oh, these? Yeah. Oh, these are uh, information points that if you go to macroinvertebrates.org, uh, you can click on them for more information. Okay. So they're not actually part of the critter, they're just... Correct. So this one is pointing to the tracheal gills. And this one is the um, end of abdomen has five sharp stiff points or three long fat gills, long flat gills. So this- uh, Do oh. they use their gills all their life or just when they're babies? <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, they lose the gills when they emerge as adults. Uh, because they no longer need it. They're terrestrial. This is how they breathe in the water. And I spend a lot of time looking at damselflies on iNaturalist. And sometimes you'll get a damselfly that looks like this at the top. And I'm like, is that an adult or is that a nymph? Because this one is clearly about ready to molt. You can see its wings very clearly. And I will tell you with all damselflies, we do not see them this clearly. So, and so, so um, and that gets into things like dichotomous keys that says, it's see the wing pads and you're looking and like, there are no wing pads. Well, it's because when they're tiny in stars or where they are in their molting series, when they're tiny, they don't have wing star in stars. And then as they grow, they do. So when I get, when I'm, looking at them at pictures of them I'm like "Ooh, what is this and then I'll always go look at the bottom and if it has tails I know it's a nymph so because it's still breathing in the water great question okay I'm going to go back to Odonata and the other rock star is the dragonfly and if you have seen dragonflies dragonflies and damselflies uh, have as adults look very similar. And let's see if I can find a picture on iNaturalist. Look at that real quick. So this is um, a dancer, dragon. I believe it's supposed to be a dragonfly. I thought dancers were damselflies, but I don't know them as adults. I know dragonflies and damselflies. <laughs> Um, so, but you can see they look very similar to dragonflies and damselflies look very similar. A lot of times it's the way their wings, people will say that it's how their wings are positioned. Um, and that's absolutely so, except with the, the damselfly, uh, with the dragonfly that has the wings pointing back. Dragonflies usually have their wings pointing out. There is one kind of dragonfly that has its wings pointing back. All right, let me try to find the, I'm getting a, okay. All right, sorry. All right, oh, I, I see why we got that picture because we're still in the Odonata. No, we're, no, we should be in the dragonfly. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, here's another one with its labial, labial mask sticking out. 
And you can see those points, those five sharp points that they were talking about. These look so different to me. This tends to be very large and robust that, you know, I'm never worried about confusing them in the nymph stage. Um, in the larval stage, in the adult stage, I'm not as confident telling dragonflies apart from damselflies. Okay, my watch says 1250. Um, I'm willing to go a few more minutes if there aren't questions or we can pause for questions because I was a few minutes late. And how did you get into learning about, about macroinvertebrates? Oh, that's a great question. I was not, uh, it was not something I, I kind of came to naturally. Um, I am working on a project called Macro Blitz, which is trying to train and equip people to go out and make observations of aquatic macroinvertebrates and upload them to my naturalist. And um, I'm doing this as part of my day job. Uh, and it, I am very late, even my day job, because these little critters can tell you a lot about the quality of water that they're living in. Uh, for example, uh, we didn't take a look at the mayfly. Um, I'll go. But that kind of uh, order has gills on its side. We talked about uh, the gills and how they breathe. Um, that kind of in critter needs pretty clear, unsedimented, unsed sedimented water to breathe. Otherwise, the gills get all filled with sediment and they can't breathe, so they don't reproduce. My job, my day job, as I said, is uh, uh, working with watersheds and clean water, and so. Um, I, I learned about them through there, but I really got into them uh, during COVID uh, because we were all like needed more hobbies <laughs> to get out more. And so I would just go out to the local stream and kind of scoop some up, scoop them up and see what there was. And I just thought it was really cool. And I thought more people should know about it. So quite a few of us now at Ollie have taken classes on citizen science. Is there a way to help monitor macroinvertebrates through citizen science? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, let me go ahead and bring up my, um, I'll go ahead and share again. If I can find the share button again, there we go. Okay, so are you familiar with iNaturalist? Yes. Okay, most of you. So there is an iNaturalist project um, called Aquatic Macroinvertebrates of North and South America. And if you take a picture of a macroinvertebrate and you get it down to um, uh, the right taxonomic level ID, it will be added to this project on iNaturalist. The reason we want people to do that is that this is creating a baseline of data for scientists and researchers to compare future changes against. We won't know what's changed until we know what we have right now. If, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the chat because I have a feeling people are gonna to wanna to, um, kind of poke around on their own. And you can have the link after um, we scoot. So, um, so yeah, when if you want to go out to a local stream, a local pond, scoop up some um, macroinvertebrates, take a picture, upload them to iNaturalist, identify them as best you can. And if you have an insect, uh, identify it on one of those nine orders. And, and if you're not sure, just tag me and I can help you identify it. My iNat handle is Ann C. Lewis. And I'm uh, always happy to put eyeballs on something that people contribute to. But you're adding uh, data to this international data set about the condition of aquatic macroinvertebrates right now. Interesting. Any other questions? Um, so, Anne, I know that you live in Pier. When you go to, for example, a Capital Lake, um, <laughs> Are you going to find anything living in there except for goldfish? Uh, you probably, yeah, you probably will. Um, I actually have not swept Capitol Lake. I probably should. I'm a little worried about security 
because oh. it's changed since you were there. I mean, yes. there's fences and, you know, but, um, you know, these grassland ponds, for example, I've spent a lot of summer, a lot of my past summer going there. So um, we can sc scroll in here and see some of the things I've seen, um, like at this little pond right here. Mm -hmm. That was a fun day. So this is, uh, oh yeah. Uh, can you still see it? The Coptomala, yes. okay, yeah. Um, to me, I thought this was just a predaceous diving beetle. And this is pretty cool because this is one of those organisms that lives in water as both uh, as a nymph or a larva and an adult. And when it's an adult, it can also be terrestrial. So um, it will fly on land, but return to water. Uh, this gentleman here, Matthew, he is the beetle dude on iNaturalist. Uh, he will find them like that and help identify them. So, but there's lots of really cool things to see. Um, let's see, I think I can search it so it's South Dakota. Um, just in what you think is just, okay, that's a grassland pond. There's probably not much up there. Um, there's a little pond near uh, in Pier, up here off of 4th Street. That is a really great place to look at that. And these are some of the observation things I've seen there. So we have a, no, these aren't mine, but, um, damselflies and yeah um are there any mega animals that can swim walk and fly um i would say the closest would come would be some sort of duck or some sort of aquatic fowl there are some that can submerge there are some that swim, of course. I'm thinking of like a loon. Usually, if they can do, they usually can do one of two, well, two of the three. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of an organism that does all three really well. Interestingly enough, loons and those aquatic fowl really depend on aquatic macroinvertebrates as part of that whole food chain. Ooh. Great questions. Are frogs invertebrates? Um, no, I think they have a backbone, don't they? Thank you. Yeah, you're getting into herpetology. This is <laughs> 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 you need to bring on a herpetologist. I have a great herpetologist for you, Thea. His name okay. is, uh, he, he runs the uh, herpetology of South Dakota on iNaturalist. Um, is that Drew? Yes. Okay, yes. I know him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, he's his iNaturalist page. You need to go with a strong stomach because he his a lot of his pictures are of things that have gotten run over, um, which you can put on iNaturalist. But yeah. And tonight you can watch about prehistoric giant uh, crocodiles and snakes on PBS. So, oh, well, that's I'm, always a good I'm time. I'm sure they're vertebrates, but they're vertebrates. Yeah. Uh, snakes are vertebrates. Snakes are vertebrates. That I do know. So. Yep. Any other questions? You guys have good questions. I love it. Well, Anne, thank you so much for your time and for joining us this week. Um, we, as, as the rest of you know, we have some uh, more Ollie shorts coming up tomorrow. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. We're going to be saving the life of people by doing some CPR online. Some new ways that you can do CPR that you don't have to touch mouse. <laughs> um, on Thursday, we're going to have how to move your dog to assisted living. And on Friday, ghost hunting in Deadwood, South Dakota. That promises to be a fun one, too. So I hope you'll all join us 1230 the rest of the week. Thank you. Tell your friends about Ollie. We're getting uh, our new semester starts March 1st. As you know, registration is this week and uh, we still can take new members. We would love to have you. So tell your friends and thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks, Anne. Thanks thank for having you. me. Yeah. Bye, everybody.